Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Using Power BI to Remove Business Process Inefficiencies, or How I Sold the C-Level Execs on Power BI. My name is Shannon Hulk, and I just want to give a quick shout out to all the women in technology today, all the SQL ladies, and a little bit about myself. I am currently a BI engineer for a company called National Cine Media in the Denver Tech Center. I've been working in IT for over 15 years. About the last six of it has been in BI. I am a Microsoft Certified Trainer and Microsoft Certified Solution Developer in VB6, if that tells you how long I've been doing this. I speak a lot of languages. Most of them are programming languages. Um, and I don't currently do any more training. I kind of like to keep my feet on the ground because I'm a busy mom of three kids. And I'm very involved in my community and with the local pass groups. If you need to contact me after today, you'll want to call me, uh, contact me on my email address, shannonholk at yahoo.com. You can also reach me via Twitter at SQL Shannon or on LinkedIn. I have a blog. It's a very sad, sad little blog because I don't have a lot of spare time. But it's at buiwerewolf.blogspot.com. And I will post the slides from today's presentation there. And I will post answers to any questions that are asked as well, and any questions that I don't manage to get to if we run out of time. So a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. I'm sure this has never happened to you, but potentially it could. Let's say the CIO comes to you and asks you to help find out why business processes are slow. And he wants the information by tomorrow, but you find out none of the data is in the warehouse yet, and none of it's in your cubes, and you've got a ton of other work to do. What, are you, what do you do? Power BI to the rescue. Today we're going to learn how you can quickly and easily build your models and create visualizations that will tell a data story and help solve everyday business problems. This is a 100 level course. I noticed some of you said you were experts and some of you said you were intermediate. You're probably not going to get a lot of new things out of this course. It's also only one hour, so it's not going to be a deep dive. What we are going to be talking about are the selling points for Power BI. Why is it cool? Why you should embrace Excel? We're going to compare the tools that are available in Power BI to what you traditionally use in the Microsoft BI stack. And then we're going to take a look at a case study for improving internal business problems or processes. And we're going to do that using Power Pivot and Power View. If you were looking for other tools, you're probably going to want to do what Liz said, and that is tune in next month. There will be a lot more courses on Power BI then. But in today's demo, we're going to be looking at Power Pivot, Power View. And in Power Pivot, I'm going to show you how you connect to data sources, how you can create relationships between your entities, build hierarchies, and create some simple calculated fields and columns. In Power View, we're going to create some data visualizations. And I'll show you additionally how to filter out some bad data if you've got outliers. So Power BI, what are the selling points? And I stole this from SQL Chick, also known as Melissa Coates, off of her blog, because I thought it was a fantastic overview of what you can see in Power BI. And the basic things are that if you have a lot of corporate data that you want to augment with some additional data from outside, maybe it's big data, maybe it's information off the internet, Power BI is great for that. If you need to build a quick prototype, or if you're doing ad hoc analysis for a one-time purpose, or you only do it once a year, again, Power BI is going to be fantastic. It's also good at creating simple reports and dashboards. If you want something more in-depth, you're still going to have to go back to some of your more traditional Microsoft stack tools, like SQL Server Reporting Services. But if it's going to be simple, you can use Power BI. If you have end users that want to connect to the data using mobile devices, that's a strong point of Power BI. If your users are creating queries that they want to share or reuse, or they need to validate somebody else's work, Power BI is perfect for that. 
If you already have Office 365 in your corporate environment and your users are comfortable with collaborating and sharing on the cloud, Power BI, again, works out well. This last point I'm not so sure I agree with Melissa on, which is that if you don't have significant IT infrastructure or support available, that this is going to be really great. I say that's true for the on-premise tools, but you've got a cloud portion to Power BI, and the setup on that sometimes can be a little bit extensive. Now, they're selling it as a service, so uh, hopefully you don't have to do as much work, but there's still some configuration involved. And Liz, if there are any questions along the way, feel free to give me a holler. No problem. And if I'm going too fast, am, am I going too fast for anyone? I don't think so, but I'll let you know if I hear otherwise. Perfect. Thank you. So I wanted to take a look at what is P, uh, Power BI at a high level. Again, I stole this from Melissa Coates. She put together one of the best uh, Visio diagrams that I've seen on Power BI that I think explains it fairly well. There are two basic parts to Power BI. One is the on-premise side, which is in Excel. And you can see here all of these tools are available to end users directly inside of Excel. Power Query, Power Pivot, Power View, and Power Map. And today we're only going to be looking at two of these. We just don't have enough time to go into the rest. There's also a cloud portion, which you'll see over on the right-hand side. Whoa, which is this side. And the nice thing about this is it gives you the ability to share and collaborate very, via the very various Power BI applications noted at the top in the orange box. And there's also a bunch of admin tools. If you want to set up data governors to control the data, those are the tools in the bottom green box that they'll have available to them. So I mentioned that we're going to be using on-premise Excel a lot. Is this Excel hell or is this Excel heaven? Most end users totally love Excel. Why? Because they use it every day. They're very comfortable with it. It's easy to use. And if they get really comfortable and they want more power, they can install more add-ins. But your CTOs and your CIOs are going to hate Excel. They call it Excel hell. Why? because you end up with a lot of data silos. People tend to create worksheets with data and then mail them around to each other. And next thing you know, you've got 40 billion copies of the same information. But each user has gone in and edited that data, and you no longer have a golden copy of that data. It's also not backed up. So if they lose their worksheet, it's not recoverable. But this is where Power BI comes in. And it, it's an Excel-based solution, so it makes users happy but it's also manageable in the cloud through the catalog of data, and you can make your data discoverable there. And that's why CTOs and CIOs are willing to take the risk. So the real takeaway from today that I want you to know is it's based on Excel, so you need to learn Excel and be really comfortable training your end users. Now, I want to compare a little bit the Power BI components to traditional BI, just to give you a frame of reference. So I've outlined on this slide some traditional tasks that you might perform and what methods you would use if you're using the standard Microsoft BI stack and what you could use, which tools you could use on the Power BI stack. And those Power BI stack tools, again, are separated between the cloud and on-premise using Excel. If I want to discover new data, traditionally I can go and query my IT sources that already exist, or I can go out to the internet and I could copy and paste, that's what a lot of end users do. With Power BI, I've got several tools at my disposal. On the cloud, I've got the Q&A tool, which is an AI tool that allows you to do natural language querying of the data in your data catalog. You've also got Power Designer. This is a new tool and it's still in preview mode, but it looks really promising. It's basically, so far it contains Power Query and Power View. But for your on-premise, you can use Power Query. If I want to share my data, traditionally I would do this through a SharePoint BI site or through lists on SharePoint. In Power BI, I can use the data catalog. Again, that's on the cloud. 
If I want to do some ETL work, I would traditionally use SQL Server Integration Services. In Power BI, I've got Power Query inside of Excel. If I want to model my data, traditionally I would use SQL Server Analysis Services. In Power BI, I can use Power Pivot inside of Excel. If I want to do data exploration, mostly our end users are going to be using pivot tables traditionally. But they can also go out and use Q&A now in the Power BI stack and use that to help them model data quickly. If I want to create a dashboard, performance point was the old way. The new way through Power BI is to use Power View, and that's actually available both on the cloud through SharePoint or on-premise using Excel. If I want to create a report or a map, traditionally I would do that in SQL Server Reporting Services, but now I've got both Power Designer and Power Map to help me out with that, in addition to using Power View if you want to create dashboard-like reports. And then if I wanted to do data governance, traditionally I can use MDS and SharePoint Custom Workflows, but in Power BI I can use the data catalog and data gateways to control and govern the data. So that's just a little bit of comparison. Hopefully that gives you a better idea and a better feel for what your tools are. And I think this is a good slide if you need to go and explain it to your CTOs or CIOs who are already very familiar with the traditional methods. Show them how Power BI equates to the old methods. Now, I want to emphasize that use of Power BI does not mean you're getting rid of all your traditional methods. I think over time we'll see a bigger shift to Power BI. But long term, there's still a lot of things that you're going to want to do using the traditional methods. Let me jump into my case study here. So this actually started out um, here at National Cine Media with my CIO coming to me with a problem. And our company is a media company. We specialize in advertising and movie theaters. If you've been to an AMC, Regal, or Cinemark and you've managed to show up before the trailers start, You'll see our first look show, which is a content show that's sort of like entertainment tonight. And you'll see advertisements dispersed throughout there. Well, a little while ago, we wanted to automate a process that would QC the ads that were sent in from small businesses. They have much smaller budgets, and uh, they tend to not give us as high quality ads as the larger companies. When we were QCing this work that came in, our units of work, had to go undergo a series of steps in the QC process. And our CIO wanted to know how effective was the automation that we did of that process. Now, I want to take just a, a second here to talk about big data. So big data right now is a huge buzzword. But most companies are already sitting on a gold mine of data. You just have to go out and find it. And this is where Power BI is really going to help you. Maybe that data is hidden in your log files, hidden in spreadsheets, or hidden in systems that you haven't even had a chance to tap. Now, for this particular case study of our advertising QC process, what I tend to do when I approach a problem is I use a couple of checklists. I have a standard checklist for requirements gathering and one for data discovery. And I've included those in the appendix of these slides. But one of the things, first things that I look at is, what is the goal? The goal in this particular case, or the business problem we were trying to solve, was that we needed to get our advertisements to the market within 72 hours of closing our deals. And then the next question I typically ask to the person who's asking me to help them solve a problem is, what questions do you have about the data? In this case, our CIO wanted to know, well, we automated the systems, but did that shave off any time? What steps are still slow? So once I find out what, the, what questions they have about the data, I tend to ask who's involved in that business process so that I know who the stakeholders are so that I can go and ask them questions if I don't understand the data. In this case, it was our editors of the advertisements and our quality control staff. Then I ask what systems are involved, if any. In this case, it was our sales system and our QC system. Once I know what the problem is, I need to go out and look for the data. So here's my little dis data discovery checklist. The first thing I want to know is what parts of this process are automated. In this particular case, our old process that we were using required a manual kickoff, and then each of the steps were performed in serial. The new process that they implemented 
automated that kickoff, and then some of the steps could now be done in parallel or side by side by multiple people. The next question I like to ask is, is that data already available through the warehouse or our queues? If it's not, who can get me access to that? Now in this case, we believed at first by asking my coworkers, where might this data exist? We already had a queue for our sales system and we already had a queue for our QC system. So I started doing my data discovery there. What I quickly found out by doing a little data profiling was that the cubes didn't actually have the data I needed. They had a lot of data, but they didn't have data specific to the process flow. So this is where Power BI came in handy for me. I didn't have the data available, so I'm going to start off by trying to go and get the data. Now, because I believe the data was in the cubes at first, I started with SSAS. Some of the tools for Power BI don't support SSAS models very well yet, but that is coming in 2016. Since I started off there, I just kept on going. Sometimes I wish I had gone back and used Power Query. But the nice thing about Power Pivot is that it lets you leverage the skills, again, that your users already have in Excel. You can mash up data from different sources and model it. And to give you, again, a frame of reference for how does this compare to the traditional SQL Server analysis services, you can create your dimensions and you can create your facts. Your dimensions are going to be flat tables because it's a tabular model. Your facts are actually just going to be measures. There's no separate table for those. They're just measures. Within the tables, you can create relationships. Now, one thing you'll notice, most of your end users, your, even your power users, don't really know much about modeling data. So they're going to struggle a little bit to create relationships. And Power Pivot is going to require that you have unique records on the parent side. When I first started playing with this, not all my records were unique, and I had to go in and massage the data a little bit to get it in that order. That's, again, why sometimes this is a great tool, but it's going to take some pretty power-driven users to be able to use it. The other things it can do is let you build hierarchies and calculated columns. If you need a column for every single row in your dimension, you can create one using DAX. So DAX is a query language that's specific to Power Pivot and tabular models. And it is Excel-like. It looks a lot like Excel formulas traditionally do, which makes it really easy for end users to adapt. When adding measures, you're again going to be using DAX. And where you place your formulas is actually down in the calculation space at the bottom. And you can put this anywhere. Now, a few things about Power Pivot under the covers. It is a client-side version of a tabular model. When I say client-side, what that really means is there's no disaster recovery built in, and it's not really shareable until somebody moves it out to the cloud or they, God forbid, email it. But it is all done on the client side. Now, behind the scenes, you have the VertiPack engine running. And it runs entirely in memory, which means it's really fast. It also uses columnar storage for high compression, and the rate is about 7 to 10 times what the data size is. For disk space and RAM, you're going to need about 2 to 3 times the size of your saved file because it's going to be decompressed at certain times when you're doing modeling. So you want to make sure that you build your model as compressible as possible. There's a lot of tips out there. I've highlighted a few from Microsoft and from SQL BI, which is Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari's website, that will give you some great tips on how you make this more compressible. For example, if you have a date-time field, almost all the values, if you go out to the millisecond, are going to be unique. So you might want to pull those out and compress it down into just a date field and a time field so that you have fewer unique values. Another thing of note is that if you are running on a 32-bit machine, you typically have a limit of 2 gigs of memory. So I do recommend a 64-bit machine where possible. Does it run on a 32-bit? A lot of times. If you're not working in the millions of millions of records, you'll probably be fine. But if you get to high levels of data, you're probably going to need a 64-bit machine. Now, there is a logical limit to what you want to set for your file size. In order to support mobile devices 
or to run on SharePoint 2013, your file size can't end up more than 10 megabytes. What that means is if there's data in your model that you don't really need, you need to take it out. And if you're using SharePoint 2013, please note that the default setting for the maximum file size is lower than 10 megabytes, so your administrator is going to have to configure this. There's also a tool out there called the Workbook Size Optimizer. I have not tested it, but Microsoft touts it as a way that you can go and shrink up your files should you need to. All right, so now I want to break into a demo of using Power Pivot. And we're going to start off inside of Excel. And one of the things I want you to note is that in Excel, if I have Power Pivot installed, it's actually an add-in. In 2016, it'll be intrinsic. It'll be built right into the system. But for now, it's an add-in. And I do have it turned on already. And in order to use it, let me just view, zoom in here so you can see what I'm talking about. Whoa. Up at the top, we've got a menu for Power Pivot right up here. Okay. So if I click on Power Pivot, I'm going to get a toolbar. And the first thing that I want to do is manage my data model, which is the first button on that toolbar. When I click it, it's going to open a separate window. And in that separate window, if I want to switch back to Excel, I've got a little button up at the top right up here in the corner that I can use to switch back. Or you can just switch back on the taskbar if you want to down at the bottom. You can see I've got a power pivot for Excel down there and I've got my regular workbook. So I can switch that way as well. Within Power Pivot, the first thing I want to do is get some data. To get my data, I can choose from your standard traditional databases, from a data service if I want to go grab the big data out from the internet. Or I like to typically go to this third choice because it lists all the options, and that is from other data sources. So today, that's where I'm going to start is up here with other data sources. When I click on other data sources, you'll see I get quite a big list. I got everything from the traditional sources to different kinds of databases. What I'm going to use today is SQL Server. And I'm going to go out to my local host. And I'm going to be looking for a database, in this instance, called QC2. And let me just rename my connection so I can find it again. And when you get into the table import wizard after checking your data or selecting your data source, it's going to give you a couple of different options. One is I can go and select my data from a list of tables and views, or I can write my own query. It really doesn't matter which you choose. If the tables and views already have the data in it, you can use them. If you prefer to write a query to cut down on the amount of data, you can do that as well. Today I've already pre-scrubbed the data and cut it down to a smaller size that's a little bit more manageable for this demo. So it's not a full size, but I'm going to select my data directly from the tables that I've built. You can see my database actually only has two tables in it. The first one is my unit of work table, and the second one is my tasks for the units of work. And I can rename them here. If I don't want to call it UOW underscore task, I can just leave that out, make it a little bit friendlier name for my end users. I can also filter the data. Remember I said that you don't want to pull in too much data because it might overtax the client machine? This is where you could go in and filter it. If you click on the table or the view that you want to filter, you can click the preview and filter button down here at the bottom. Ooh, I can't draw. And when you click on that button, you'll be able to get a preview of the data and see the different columns. So I've got my unique identifier. I've got when the process started, when it ended, what the deadline is for this unit of work, who initiated it, was it initiated manually or was it initiated by the system, and is it in the process period for the old method or the new method. I could from here filter things out if I wanted to. In this case I don't really want to, but you can see I could filter the data before I even import it. 
For the task table, let's look at that one just to see what we have. Again, I have a unit of work, a task ID, what stage, step, and task it occurred in, when it was created, when it was completed, and how many minutes it took to complete that task. Now, up at the top, one of the things I want you to see in this header row is that we've got a bunch of checkboxes. What this allows me to do is remove columns if I want to. In this case, my task ID, I'm really not going to end up using it today, so I can uncheck that box because it's got a lot of unique values. In fact, every single one of them will probably be unique. And for compression's sake, I want to get rid of that column. I also, since I've already calculated how many minutes it took to complete, I really don't need, in this case, the date that the task was created or the date that it was completed. So I'm going to remove those columns as well. And I click on OK. And you can see here that I've applied filters to this. Shows it right here in my filter details. When I click on Finish, it'll import this data and it'll tell me, tell me how many rows came in. In this case, my data set isn't very big, so I'm not worried about exceeding the memory on my machine, which is good because I think I only have 8 gigs on this box. It's a pretty small data set. should be fine. I've got about 6,000 units of work and about 113,000, 114,000, give or take, tasks. When I close this out, it'll add the data in, and you'll see that it's added it on two separate sheets. Whoa! And down at the bottom, here it is, my two tabs for unit of work and task. It also shows me right here the number of records that were involved in each of those. And I can see my data is listed out here, along with my tasks are listed as well. So my data is all there. I've got dimensions. Remember I said that each of these is going to turn into a dimension. But I need some measures. In order to create measures, where you're going to work is down in the bottom in the calculation area. So down in the bottom, I've got this section. You can see that there is a splitter bar down here at the bottom that separates my data from my calculation area. And I can work anywhere in there. In fact, it doesn't matter if I create the value here or if I create the value on task. Uh, it's going to be able to calculate those values. If I click in any cell down here at the bottom, let's say I want to get a count of how many units of work are involved. I can create a measure for that by clicking in the cell. And then up at the top in the menu, I have a calculation section on my main home tab. And this is where I'm going to find some standard calculations. If I need to, I can always go back and get more detailed functions or other DAX functions on the design tab under the Insert Function section. But today we're only going to be doing some really simple calculations. I've taken a full day course from Marco Russo on using tabular models and one from Alberto Ferrari on using DAX. And it's not all that simple. Um, your power users are going to need a little bit of training for that for sure. So in this case, I just want to do a simple calculation, a standard one. I want to get a count. So back on my calculation section, I'm going to go ahead and choose count. When I click on, whoops, didn't mean to auto sum. If you accidentally create a measure, they're really easy to get rid of. You just hit delete and delete it back from your model. What I really wanted to select there was a count. And it'll automatically create a measure for me. If I widen that out, you can see I've got a count down there. Now I may want to format that because it doesn't have a comma separator. Up here in the top, I've got a formatting section right here where I can choose a data type and I can choose the format, a standard named format, or I can choose these quick formatting buttons. I just want to add a comma to that. And then I need to get rid of the decimals because I don't really need those. Now, the formula, what it looks like, you might be able to see this up here at the top, and I'm going to try and make this a little bit bigger. Yeah. Just one moment, got to move something out of the way. 
So what I can do to see that, I'll expand it out and see if I can get my machine to cooperate and make that a little bit bigger. And sometimes Excel does not want to cooperate. Let me try one more time. There we go. Okay, so you can see here that it's created a name, count of UOWID, and then it's put in a formula for me where it's counting the identifiers. Now, I may want to change the name, and I can just highlight that and change it to UOW count, and hit enter, and it's renamed that. Now, I might also want to get a calculation for how long did the process take overall. I've got a process started date and a process ended date. Let's say I want to know for every single one of these units of work how much that ad added up to. I can add a new column by double clicking in the new column where it says add column and I can type in a name or like I just did there accidentally insert another column. So let me name this column. I'm going to call this whoa. I, I want to call this days to complete. And let me get rid of this extra column again. And in the formula, to create the formula for this, I can click anywhere in this column. It doesn't actually matter where. And to start a formula, I just press the equal sign, just like you would for creating a normal Excel function. And it starts a formula up in the formula bar, and then I can click on the columns. I want to take process ended and subtract process started from it. I want to hit enter. It'll fill in a value for every single row. Now, it probably looks a little bit funny because, of course, it did date math and gave me back a date. I really don't want it to be formatted as a date. I want to change this to an actual number. And having a little issue here. So sometimes what I found is you get stuck inside of Power Pivot. If you save, in case I'm going to save this workbook and come back, hopefully that should resolve my problem. If I go back and manage my model, again, I should be able to hopefully now, yep, choose that I want this to be a decimal number. And it's given me a ridiculous number of decimal places, so I'm going to get rid of those. Maybe I only want one decimal place. I can do that again under this formatting menu up at the top, right up here. So that gives me my days to complete. Now what I want to know is an average. What was the average for all of those records? So I'm going to create another calculated measure down in my calculation area. Again, it doesn't matter where you put it, but just for ease, I'm going to put it right under this column. And I'm going to choose one of my standard choices, which is average. And it will put out there for me the average of days to complete. Gives it a column name. Now notice that when it's using these columns, it puts them in square brackets. You can also specify the table name if I wanted to. For example, this one is coming from the unit of work. And let's use a single quote with UOW, that's the table name, and the column. I can specify that. Now, with it, when it's actually from your dimension table, that's great. But if I want to do a formula that is using another formula, because you can move these things around, you probably don't want to reference the actual table that it's currently on in case you move it to another table. Let's say that I wanted to take and add a second formula that uses this days to complete but converts it into hours. I just need to take the number of days times 24. To do that, I'm going to start with the formula and I'm going to call it hours, average hours to complete. Colon equals, let me just zoom to make that a little bit bigger. Maybe. There we go. And in the average hours to complete, I can then click on my other formula and take it times 24. And now I've got a second calculation. Again, I need to format it because it's not quite how I'd like it to be. And that will give me an average number of hours to complete. 
Now, if I want to compare the values and see how I'm doing and see if these values, how they're changing on the fly, what I can do is filter the data directly in here. Again, we've got at the top some filter options that you can see by these drop-downs. If I click on the drop-down for process period and I want to only look at the new method and not the old method, I can uncheck old method, click on OK, and you'll see my, at the bottom, my unit of work count went down, and also my average days to complete and average hours to complete went down as well. If I want to be able to compare them side by side, though, this isn't a very good tool. I can switch to a pivot table, which most of our users are used to using, and there's an option for that up in the menu bar. And I can switch over to using the pivot table. I'm going to click on pivot table here. And it lets me put it in either a new worksheet or an existing worksheet. I'm just going to use the existing worksheet. And I've got a pivot table. Over here on the right-hand side are my fields. You can see them listed here for task and the unit of work. So if I wanted to look at the unit of work and compare the number of items I have, let me move this toolbar out of the way a second, what I can do is find my unit of work count, check that box, and I've got a count. Now if I want to compare it by processing period, old to new, check that box as well, and now I can compare them side by side. I might want to add in my average number of days to complete, and you can see that the new method, I've been putting both more jobs or more of our units of work through, and I've also cut down the number of days to complete in almost half. So that's good news for my CIO. So things are definitely working. I might also want to add in here things like uh, who initiated it. When I click on that, you're going to see the manual system and the uh, new system compared side by side when the system initiated the, it versus the manual method. And what you'll see here is though, even though we've automated this, we still have some users that are kicking it off manually. So they're bypassing the process a little bit. How did that affect our numbers? Well, you'll notice here that my days to complete is a lot higher when they manually kick off the process. So this is something my CIO wants to know and be able to take back to the business unit to help them pinpoint the problems. So this information is really great. What if I want to know it on a task level? In my task, I have already a calculation about the minutes to complete. If I check on it, even though I haven't created a measure in a pivot table, it will automatically try and sum that. But what you'll notice here is that my sum of minutes to complete is the same for everything. And the reason why is I don't have a relationship built. If you look over on the right-hand side, what you'll see is this little box that says, relationships between my tables may need to be created. That's a great hint. If I go in and click on create, it comes up with a little box. You can use this box to create the relationships. I struggle with it every time because I'm not sure which one's the parent, which one's the child. I always get it backwards. So what I find is that it's a little bit easier for me to go back into my data model. And traditionally, you get kicked into the data view, but there's also a diagram view. You can see it up here in the corner. I'm in data view, but there's also this diagram view right here. And that's probably where I want to work to create my relationships, because it's a visual picture. There's also a shortcut to that down in the lower right-hand corner, down here by my clock. You can see it. Oops. Are those two buttons where you can select either the data view or the diagram view. If I click on the diagram view, I'll see a visual representation of the unit of work and the task table. And I can see I don't have a relationship built between them. Again, relationships are a little bit confusing for end users if they've never done database modeling before. But what you want to do is find the parent table, in this case the unit of work, and drag from the field that matches on the parent to the child, and it will create that relationship. When I switch back to my sheet, you can see that those numbers have now changed. Now, the sum of minutes to complete is a little bit obnoxious. What I really want to see is an average. 
And some users will be smart enough to go down here and change this. Others might want it spelled out for them. So we're going to go in and create inside of our data view another measure. This time I'm going to switch over to the task table. So down at the bottom, I'm going to select the task tab to get me to that entity. And I want to go in here and I want to create the average number of minutes to complete. Again, this is a simple formula that I, that I can select from my standard home menu over here on the right. So I can choose average here. And you'll see that the format on it is really obnoxious. So I want to change that and reduce some of those decimals. And so my average number of minutes to complete is around 518. Well, looks a little bit funny here. And probably if we go back to our demo, let's add that in instead of our standard one. And you'll see now because it's splitting it out, the numbers look more reasonable. But I might also want to break that down by stage, step, and task. Now, I already know that there really should probably be a hierarchy here. So let's take a look at how you create a hierarchy. So inside of my Power Pivot model, I can go back to that diagram view. And I can select the fields that I want to include in a hierarchy. I can control click or shift click, however I want to access those. And then I can right click and choose Create Hierarchy from the menu. When I do that, it builds a hierarchy for me and I can name it. I'm going to call it Process Workflow. And if I get these things in the wrong order, I can grab them and drag them around. I can rename them if I want to as well. But now I should have a hierarchy and if I go back to my data, now in my task I see this process workflow and I can split things out by it. One other thing you might want to do, you'll notice here that stage, step, and task are still listed as individual selectors. Sometimes it causes problems for users because they'll try and filter based on both of them. So in my model, the other thing that I can do is I can go in and select those fields and just right click and choose hide from client tools so that people won't accidentally do that. And if I go back to my model, Inside of the pivot table, you can see that if I look at the task, I can no longer choose those fields. So those are just some basic things that you can do. Now I mentioned I've got a lot of numbers on here, and now it's getting really hard to see this. So I probably need something visual in order to work with these. So this is where we're going to switch over to PowerView. So PowerView is like performance point for end users, and it's really good for the graphically challenged. I am not good at graphs. I'm not good at charts. So I really suck at it. So I really actually like PowerView. It lets you explore the data visually. You can drag the metrics on really quickly and change them. You can change the graph type. There's lots of types that are predefined for you. You can change the slicers and the filters on the fly. So it's really cool for doing that. Let's take a look at how we would use that. So back in our Excel workbook, Now, when we're looking for Power View, Power Pivot has its own menu, but for whatever reason, Power View does not. So in order to add it, I'm going to have to go to the Insert menu. And under the Insert menu, what I'm going to find is there's an option over about three quarters of the way down for Power View. If I click on that, it'll create for me. a Power View slide, or Power View view, if you want to call it. And what we'll see is there's different parts to this Power View slide. The first part that we've got is, try that again, this section, which is my workspace, where I'm going to drag fields on and let people view them. I've also got a filter section, where I can go in and filter the data. We'll take a more in-depth look at that in a few moments. And then I've got my list of fields over on the right that I can choose from. The first thing I want to do is start dragging some data on. So we started with our units of work. If I want to show my CIO how many, 
how much throughput did we have? I can grab this unit of work count. I can just check it or I can drag it on. Either way is going to work. And it will stick it out there for me. And it just gives me a table to start out with. I can change my table to a different type. I can use different charts. I tend to think I like to keep it simple. I'm going to use a stacked column today. And this will show me that we've had over 6,000 units of work that went through. But I want to divide those out by the processing period so I can compare those side by side. So I check the box for process period. And it shows me the new method and the old method. Now they're a little bit backwards, so I'm going to switch them. And I can see them both in here now side by side, and I can see we've got higher throughput with the new process. Let's say I want to know a little bit more. I want to look at and compare also the average number of hours it took to complete these. I want this on a new viewer, so I'm just going to grab this field and drag it out and drop it out here. And I can expand that out and change it to a chart. And then again, I want to compare my process periods. And again, they're a little bit backwards, but I'll switch that in a second. I might want to also be able to divide this out by who initiated it. If I check that, it'll throw it into my legend. And I really don't want these stacked because they're completely separate. So I'm going to drag that field. You can see it over here in the right that it got stuck into this section for the legend. I don't really want it in the legend. I probably want it in the vertical multiples. So I'm going to try that. And if I drag it here, it'll separate those two out. Now, it seems a little bit weird here to do new method, old method, new method, old method, and try and figure out what was manual and what was system. I really want to look at the new method side by side and the old method side by side. And I told you I was graphically challenged. <laughs> so what I tend to do is I put things on wrong, and then I drag them to the place they need to be. So I'm going to go back over here to the corner, and I'm just going to switch the axis and the vertical multiples. And if I drag those around, now lets me see my new method compared to my old method. They're backwards again, so I'll sort it. You can see under the old method, it took about 120 hours on the average. Under the new method, the manual is down to 87 and a half hours. And if it's system initiated, it's down to 59 and a half. Now, this isn't good because this is above the 72-hour target that we were aiming for, so we've got some work here in our business to do. Now, my slide's a little bit full. I can add a title. I can pretty it up. One other thing you should note is that if I want to just highlight the old method or the new method, I can click on those, and it'll automatically just focus on those on the charts. Again, really neat tool for that. The other thing is I don't have a lot of control over the colors. Those are being chosen for me. That's good and bad. We'll talk about that in a second. I want to add another slide. Now, this is interesting. Once I create Power View, I do get a Power View menu up at the top. You can see that here. And now I can add another slide by just clicking Power View here. So I'm going to click Power View here. And this time I want to look at it at a task level. Which one of our tasks is taking so long to complete? So I'm going to add the average number of minutes to complete. And I want to see that as a chart again. So I'm going to switch to chart. Again, you could use a bunch of other chart types, but to keep it simple today, I'm just going to use one type. And then I can divide it out by my process workflow. And you can see that, wow, step number six here, stage number six, takes really long, and so does nine. But how does that compare using the old process and the new process? I just click on my process period and it'll give me a visual. Now, an interesting thing that's happened here is I've got some blanks that showed up. What that probably means is my child data had more stuff than the parent, so I've got some things that didn't match. And I want to filter those out because they're kind of junk. Maybe later I want to go back and look at what's causing that outliner, but for right now, I don't really need it. What you'll see over here in the filters section is that I've now got an option to either filter by the view or by the chart. View means I want to view this, but I don't want it to affect the actual chart. I can drag fields in there that completely are not related. Maybe I want to filter it by deadline. I could drag it into view. In this case, I want to filter by something that's already on the chart, and that is which process uh, period it's in. And I just want to get rid of the blanks. So I'm going to choose new and old and just compare those side by side. Now, in just looking at this chart, I can see the old method, which is yellow, and the new method, which is orange. And I can see that, for the most part, the orange is smaller than the yellow method, right? But 
And some of these, it's still almost equal. In fact, actually, it looks like in the new method, it's taking longer. So I'm going to filter that a little bit further. I want to focus on the new method. I can uncheck old method and just focus on that. And I have the ability to do a drill down. If I double click on this stage number six, I go in and I can see, oh, of the steps that it's taking, my QC level two is taking the longest. And if I double click on that, I can go in further. And what I see here is that the approval at the level A and the approval at the level B are taking a lot of time. And when I compare this, these numbers are actually the same. In the new process, it was parallel, so things were a, supposed to be done in parallel, but uh, they're taking just as long or longer. So that's another place that my CIO is going to want to go talk to the business about. So those are some things that you can do. This is, again, just a high-level overview of PowerView. Whoa, jump to where I didn't want to be. A few key takeaways from Power Pivot and Power View before we run out of time here. The advantages of Power Pivot is that you can model really quickly. You can use it with SSAS data sources. In 2016, you'll be able to use more of the Power Tools with SSAS. You can also use an Excel function like language called DAX, which is a lot easier for end users. Now, I've got also a list of disadvantages over here, and it looks really long. But when you weigh it out, the advantages are actually a lot stronger. Some of the disadvantages or things that I've run into is you have a limited number of transforms that you can apply. You really need Power Query if you're going to have to do a lot of ETL work. If you rename the columns and the measures, it's a complete pain. So if I rename my calculated columns, my measures don't match up automatically. They are fixing this in 2016. If I, I have to do a lot of window switching, which is a pain, but Power Designer, I think, is going to eliminate some of that. And you have to save, and save a lot. But save will actually kick you out of your model and into the spreadsheet, which causes you to have to switch windows again. And sometimes files get corrupted. My first attempt at using synonyms completely corrupted my file. This goes back to save and save often. And end users are going to have to create flat tables, or they're going to have to learn what a relationship is. For Power View, my first advantage and disadvantage is the same. Less control over colors. That's an advantage for those of us that are graphically challenged. But it's a disadvantage for users who like to control that color a little bit. Visual drill downs are awesome. Anyone can use it. Anyone can change it. It's a lot simpler than modeling the data in Power Pivot. And you can filter things in and out. The disadvantages are in addition to the less control over colors, that sometimes it crashes, and it's a little bit hard to find on the menu. But those are pretty small problems. In summary, Power BI is a really cool set of tools, but it contains both cloud and on-premise components. We went through and compared those, and we talked a little bit about using checklists to gather our requirements and do data discovery and how that can help you. Again, I've included those in the appendix. We've also talked about Power Pivot and Power View and how to use them. I give you a simple overview about how to connect to data sources, how to build relationships and hierarchies, how to create calculated fields and measures, and then how to use Power View to visualize the data and filter it. And I really want you to start embracing Excel. So that takes us up to the Q&A section. Liz, are there any questions? Yep, there's a couple. Um, how do you write formulas that don't get affected by what you're filtering down to? So typically what you're going to do with that, hmm, trying to think of some good formulas. My DAX is a little bit sketchy, uh, but typically you can control the filtering and you can set, I believe you can filter it so that you use all instead of having it filter to the filter context. I can double check on that and get back to you on that answer. I can post that in my blog. But I'm pretty sure I think it has to do with setting all on the filter context within your calculate formula. OK, and then a couple people are asking you know, to make sure that they can get a copy of your slide deck. Um, are you going to you are going to post that on your blog as well? Yes, I plan on posting that on my blog. If you don't see it by Saturday, uh, shoot me an email and, or give me a holler on Twitter and hassle me about it. OK. Um, someone wants to know how they can use the workbook setting. 
how they can use the workbook setting. Mm, can they clarify what they're talking about with the workbook setting? Let's, let's wait and see. <laughs> Is that uh, something inside of Power Pivot or Power View? It doesn't sound familiar to me, but I'm not a Power, I won't say that I'm a Power View or Power Pivot expert at this point. But I wanted to show today really how easy it is to get started. Because I know I've seen demos of Power BI for over a year, but it took me having an actual project to really give me impetus to drive, dive into it and really use it. Yeah. They, they mentioned the workbook setting in Power Query. Inside of Power Query. So that I don't know. It wasn't part of our demo today. I can double check on that. Liz, can you send me a list of these questions? Yep. Done? Okay, awesome. And someone wants to know if you'll put um, your blog information back up again. Ooh, uh, yes, I can do that. Whoa, that didn't go where I wanted. Hang on. So my blog is at biwerewolf.blogspot.com. Okay. Um, someone wants to know if you can show how to calculate the measure again. How to calculate the measures again. Sure. So inside of Power Pivot, I'm going to go, right now I'm in the diagram view. I'm going to switch back over to the data view. And in the data view, I can click again anywhere down here at the bottom. Let's say I wanted to know how many unique units of work I had here down in this calculation formula. I can go up and choose from the calculations menu and choose the option for distinct count. And that will give me a distinct distinct count of my units of work. Again, I can rename that if I don't like the name. I can modify the formula and use, choose something else. But these are just simple formulas. Again, learning DAX itself takes a little bit of time. But if I want to rename this in front of the colon equals, I can put in unique units of work. And let me see if I can get that to bigger and create that formula. Does that answer the question? I think so. Awesome. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have for. Um, if you decide you have any more questions, you can feel free to email me, Liz, directly. Um, it comes automatically with all your th responses that you get from GoToWebinar, um, or you can submit it to Shannon directly at her email address. Um, but if not, thank you again, everybody, and we'll let you know when that blog gets posted. Thanks, Shannon. You bet. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks.